Hi everybody, welcome to Broadway Con. So my name is Kobe Cassell and I'm the editor-in-chief of Theaterly as well as overseeing some content with Hollywood.com and I'm super excited to be here with the cast and the stage manager of Back to the Future, the musical. Um, so to start, I figured we would just kind of go down the line and maybe if you want to introduce yourself and then also, this is a little icebreaker, give us your favorite 80s film that isn't Back to the Future. Hi everybody. <laughs> My name is Jelani Remy. I played a little Goldie Wilson in Back to the Future. Um, I was, uh, my favorite 80s movie? Can I say a cartoon? Yeah. Jam and the Holograms. which was a movie, kind of. Not a musical, not a musical. Perhaps it might be one day. Maybe. Um, so, it's a really exciting time for Back to the Future because they just celebrated one year on Broadway. <laughs> How many folks in the audience have, has seen Back to the Future? <laughs> Yay. Okay, so this will be really fun to kind of dive in and chat with all of you. I figured we'll chat for about 40, 45 minutes and then leave about 15 minutes for questions. <laughs> <laughs> So start thinking of your questions now. Um, <laughs> Saying what everybody's thinking. Come on. Don't worry. We'll be. Let's First of all, let's talk about these chairs. These are the weirdest chairs I've ever. Made. They are. I don't know if they're emasculating. There's something weird happening. No, no, no. no. It's. it's you, you look really your skinny. Arms like this. You get weird. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's, it's squeezing you. It does the squeeze thing. Yes, right? it's squeezing yeah, you. It does. It's not good for me. Oh. Is it a little bit more comfortable? Delorean is uncomfortable. It's more comfortable than the Delorean. It's open wider. It doesn't open any wider. It's in full. It's in full, full bloom. I love that. It's just something about it. Oh. oh, how do you know your chair so well? I don't know. And when you're and you're on set shooting anything, what happens is you sit in one of these things and all of your confidence slowly dissipates. It's <laughs> you think you're gonna be good in the next scene you're gonna shoot, and then you spend a little time in your director's chair and you go, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> so, I feel really fun. so I figured to start, I would love to go down the line and just see when was the first time you all remember seeing the original film Back to the Future? Uh sure. Uh, I saw it with my mom uh, at an age that was so young that I don't even remember. I just, it was, it felt like a, 
basically like um, the national anthem, kind of. Like it's just like you don't know when you learned the national anthem, you just remember knowing it always because that you grew up in America. If you grew up in America, yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, that I, I just have always known it. I remember watching it with my oldest brother. He was watching me one night and he put that on for me to just be quiet. And <laughs> it worked because I was, I was sort of enthralled with, with the time travel and Doc and all that. But it was a long time ago. But since, it was, it's like Casey said, it's sort of like you have it on, it's like an Americana classic. So you always, it's always on somewhere. You know, it's always on some sort of TV on repeat. Either it's like Thanksgiving or New Year's or some sort of movie marathon, it's gonna be there. And you're always like, ah, oh, yeah, back to the future. You don't turn it off. You don't turn it off. You can't. No. I saw it at the movie theater uh, with a friend of mine who had a huge crush on Michael J. Fox. And I saw it with a group of friends in, in, I was fresh out of college, and all we thought about was how are we going to get an equity card and what type are we, meaning like what kind of roles are we going to play. So most of us watched the movie and thinking, oh, I could have, I wish I was more like, oh, I could have, you know. So it was, it was, but we loved it. It was really, it was, it's a great movie. Yeah. So, but we had a good time. So Roger, I want to start with you because you've been involved with this musical for quite a few years now, dating back to Manchester and London. How did you first get involved with it? So I was, uh, I was in Los Angeles and um, I got a, a, an appointment to put myself on tape. And it was one of those fun ones where um, they said, um, prepare literally like almost every scene in the movie. So it was just enormous. So I, I, in my living room, I um, put myself on tape and then they asked for a song and I sang um, uh, the Talking head song uh, um, uh, that goes, you know, you may find yourself living in a shotgun shack. And you may find yourself living in another part of the world. Once in a lifetime, yeah. So it was, it was really kind of a fun choice, but I love the idea that he was, that, that it had that kind of energy to it. And, um, and then that was in 2015, believe it or not. So I was young, and I put a lampshade on my head <laughs> as, a, as a, to read minds, and I wore a pair of headphones, and I had a, um, what are those, a, a, Atari, is that what they're called? Yeah. Atari uh, things that I was pretending to kind of steer the car, which I think he kind of did have. So it was, that was a long time, it was fun. But that's about my initial uh, thing, and then uh, uh, fortunately got hired, and then the whole thing got kind of shelved for about a year and a half after that for the reasons that are, are boring. <laughs> and then I'd love to just go down the line for the three of you, when did you all get involved? Or when, when you first heard about it, tell me, tell me. Yeah, I heard about it when it was announced um, in 2018, and uh, I, uh, I followed the Instagram page, which I've never done since, and I uh, didn't do before. I've never followed Musical's Conception, um, just because, um, boring reasons. Um, but I, 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 I just remember following it, and, and never thinking I would be playing Marty, but I just was like, oh, that's a really crazy idea, so I can't wait to see how they do this. Um, and uh, when, it came, when they announced they were coming to Broadway, um, I was doing a show called Almost Famous at the time, and I was, thank you, all two of you that saw it, thank you so much. Um, uh, and it was, um, the, it was a great show, and, and, and I really, uh, I just assumed it was gonna last uh, really long, so, so they asked me to audition, and I, I couldn't um, for that, and, and some other reasons. Um, and then they came back around, and um, uh, my show closed, uh, uh, not thankfully and thankfully, and um, I auditioned again, and it, and it happened pretty quickly after that, so that was really special. John Rando uh, approached me at the Tony Awards when I was getting ready to uh, get the cast that I was with for the show that I was doing at the time. Um, so that was a little awkward because it was in front of the director of that show. <laughs> so that's, that's how I got involved. Um, I got a breakdown from my agent and I kept sort of putting it off for a while, and then did this gig for Hermes, where they had you do a whole musical written by, uh, that's a book, well, that's actually kind of interesting. <laughs> Hermes had a store opening, and they hired a whole slew of Broadway actors for like four months to do this show for one night. And Chris Bailey was a choreographer of that. And so I got to work with him, and he's like, you know, you should maybe think about auditioning for Back to the Future. <laughs> Was that good? Okay. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. And then I went into the room and it was a whole room of people that I knew. Our producers from Smokey Joe's, the show I did. Anybody? <laughs> Two. 
Um, and uh, this is a room full of love, so I walked in, and the weight was lifted off my shoulders, and uh, sort of went with it. I love that. I first saw the show in 2021 over in London, and it was one of the first times I saw a show so much, loved it, and went back the next night, because I just said, oh, I need to see the show again. And then since being on Broadway- Obviously, I was on vacation, probably. <laughs> you were in one night, you were not in the other night. Um, <laughs> And uh, I've since seen the show quite a few times here on Broadway, but I just went back to revisit it last week, and the audiences are still just going absolutely wild, absolutely insane. So I'm wondering, do any of you have a fun audience interaction, stage door moment, fan mail, memory from this past year that you want to share? Multiple. I mean, I love, the, everybody's doing these bracelets now, and we get a lot of fun friendship bracelets at the stage door, which is super fun. Also, we have friends that are coming over 40 times, you know, that they're at their 40th performance and they come dressed up. I mean, Megan, will you stand up? I mean, you're one of those people that are always at the show with beaming, and your mom too. <laughs> and what number was yesterday? What number was yesterday? What number was yesterday? 27. <laughs> you know, so it's thrilling for us to make this wonderful connection with people that are getting, you know, their joy, but also we're getting joy by seeing you again and again and again because there's something working, right? There's something that is, is really wonderful. Yeah, along the lines of that, I just I, I also love that those people who, who re, are repeat visitors see that the show constantly evolves. Um, the improvisation between us uh, constantly evolves. The script uh, becomes longer. Um, the show becomes, uh, <laughs> we'll get into that. We'll get into that. Uh, it's not longer. I think the thing about the show is that it's custom. You know, every performance is so custom to that show, to that night. You know, so there's something different every day. It's a custom. It is. No. It's a yeah. custom show. Yeah, so when, when Julia gives us notes about the improv, she says it was a little too custom today. Um... <laughs> <laughs> what was that about? Fan mail? Oh, no. Fan no. interaction. You know, I will say we do, we do get a lot of invites to graduations, weddings. Can we go? Can we go? <laughs> They're on the call board. Oh. Yeah, we can invite it. They send us their announcements for their graduation and weddings and things. We can't go there usually on Sunday. Oh, Bob. Um, uh, so I know we all just celebrated, we, I'm not the chef, just a fan. Um, I know we all just celebrated one year on Broadway. Congratulations again, it's really exciting. <laughs> I wonder if you can talk about the act of doing the same show over and over again for 12 months, or for Roger for years and years in multiple cities around the world, and how do you keep it fresh? How do you keep it new and exciting so that every night you're not just going out there and doing the same thing? Well, you know, it's, it, it, we have the, the, the audience is like a blind date every night, so it, there's the, the third party in our, it, it, I, I usually work with one other person, and thank goodness it's Casey. And, um, and we have the, you know, the audience is so uh, wonderful and has different personalities, so every night is different because it is one of those shows where we, we have that scene partner, which is the audience. And, you know, we were, uh, you know, I was uh, trained, and this is, I, I, pardon me if this gets too out there, uh, silly acting-wise, but I was trained in a way uh, with uh, Meisner technique. It's a lot of time spent on talking and listening, and it's very, very important, and at the time it seemed very tedious when you're learning it, but really so much of it is about um, listening and responding. So what keeps it fresh for me always is, and what keep, when I'm in either my head or I feel like I'm being, I'm a little out of it and not focused, I just try to listen to, uh, to Casey and to watch him. And, and then we have a sense of play. That's what always happens if you just remain open and you remain um, in, in a way that is, uh, where there's fluidity. And that's, that's really ultimately the, the only uh, way you kind of keep yourself um, sane and keeps uh, keeps it fresh and 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 sometimes real and sometimes just playful um, and the and the hardest you know the, the actors who will often get the most bored quickly are ones who you know kind of work out their show and just are intractable and um, they're they're not really much fun to work with because you'll you'll never be surprised by them but I try to always make sure that he's surprised like today even I was just I'll just turn line readings upside down and uh, reemphasize them and in a way that catches um, him a little off guard and makes him uh, uh, listen. He has to listen harder because it's not, you get into a rope thing, right? Is that pretty much it? So I mean, those, that's truly what, what keeps it very fresh. But mostly, it's just great audiences and, and great blind dates, you know what I mean? It's really funny. What? Oh. Um, 
Somebody once told me that there's somebody seeing you perform for the first time or someone seeing you perform for the last time. So it's fun to give them something to remember. So that's what I sort of take with me. But also this show is like a roller coaster. Once that, once the overture starts, it's like buckle up because it's, it's, it's going fast. And um, it's a fun ride to watch. I'm, I'm not in a lot of the show, but I get to watch and absorb a lot of the show and feel that energy and to, and to hear it, especially when it, when it does um, become custom. Um, <laughs> but there's something that is so special and alive about this particular show that is unlike any other show that I've done. Oh, I, I totally agree with, with both what they, they, they're very smart at, at describing the acting process um, very, um, a lot better than I am. Um, I, 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 the only thing I've sort of realized recently as a, as a newcomer to this industry um, in the past four years, uh, five years, um, is that I have begun learning the act of, of, of accepting this as a job, which I think is also kind of interesting. It's, it, it's been my existential purpose since I was three years old. So, uh, but with an existential purpose, it, 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 sometimes it can become too um, high stakes, which I think it's very important, especially for a show like this, to remind yourself that it's not that high stakes. It's performing, and it's, it's being able to tell a story, and it's not life or death. And um, you know, you show up and you give what you have on the day. And uh, what I have on the day, if it is an 80%, I'm gonna give you maybe 85%. And then, uh, you know, I'll just give you just a little bit more than what I have on the day. But uh, fortunately, earlier today, I had like a, a good 95. Um, I'll probably have 100 tonight because I'll have more woken up. Um, <laughs> Who's coming tonight to find out? Anyone coming tonight? That guy. That, oh, <laughs> two, three, three, yes! <laughs> So, uh, wow, I just set up expectations for myself. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, uh, that's it. Totally. I think what's cool about this panel is that, at least for us in the Broadway press, we always get to chat with the actors, and we love you, it's so exciting, but we never really get to talk with stage managers. And so for Julia, um, kind of the same question for you, what is it like to upkeep this show? It's obviously a massive technical show, what is it like the behind the scenes daily efforts to keep it running, keeping it up to date, so that it looks like what opening night looked like 12 months later? Fortunately, I have two things. I have a really uh, great crew. We have a great crew that we work with, and everyone is super devoted to the show. Everyone, uh, any crew person that you don't see, which is when we're doing our jobs well, you don't see them. Um, or me, and uh, they're great. It's a great building, and, and that's a very unique thing um, to, I've had the good fortune of been doing this for quite a while now, and this building is really special. Everyone is very devoted to doing the best show they can, from the house carpenter, who is a local one man, to our stage right props assistant, Marta, who joined the show more recently, but she's always very concerned that she is able to take care of the cast and make sure they feel safe and taken care of. So that's the, the one thing. And the other thing uh, is having an open dialogue. Having an open dialogue with the, with the cast and with the creative team and knowing what they want, what they need, and you protect that. You protect the people who are actually being very vulnerable in front of the audience. And it takes a lot of focus. And uh, one, recently I had like a stretch of two or three shows where I was calling and it did a horrible job. And um, I mean, it, it wasn't as horrible as probably I felt it was, but one thing I had to remember is when you're polishing the stone, polish the stone. Don't try, the, my, my weak point is I'll, I'll try to watch the show, a moment that I've just talked to someone about, or I'll try to watch something that has been going wrong technically instead of just focusing and calling the show. So it's really about keeping focused and whatever it is that you're doing, the tasks that you're doing, making sure you're doing that task. You're so vulnerable today, Julia. This is, these are really <laughs> deep answers. Yeah. 
Thank you. We should talk more. We should grab a drink. Yeah. Uh, it's good stuff, Joey. Can you tell me what, uh, explain to me what Local One is? No, I know, but they might not. Oh. Local One is the stagehands who are of New York City. So we have Local One stagehands, and those are the stagehands that are with the theater. They're the ones that are with the particular theater. So in the Winter Garden, there are Local One stagehands, and then there are what we call Pink Contract stagehands. And Pink Contract stagehands work for the show. They don't work, they don't work for the theater, they work for our show. So we have both of those that, and we happen to have some great local one stagehands. Um, maybe not so good on one occasion, but. <laughs> I don't know, T, 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 hold on. No, no, honestly, we have some really good people that love the show and, and, and uh, Pink Carpenters are wonderful. The contract partners, the ones such as Marta. Us. Marta's a pink contract. Yeah, Marta, Sean, there are Sean is our pink You know partner. Sean. <laughs> you know him. He's got a mustache. <laughs> um, Jelani, I want to chat with you for a second. Your song in Act One is just absolutely so fun. Every time Woo! I'm watching, it's just Woo! such a fun. Um, but you also get to play two different roles in the show, which is exciting. I'm curious if you have a favorite moment on stage to do every day, or if that changes, and a favorite moment to watch from the wings. Wow. Um, I think, real talk, there's not many shows that allow an actor to say the words white trash. <laughs> and I get to do that in the dumpster scene um, with Casey, which is super fun. In a way of comedy. You know, um, I think also I think one of my other favorite times on stage is when I get to get a broom thrown and I get to have, oh, spoiler alert, that happens. Um, and it's a really fun moment and it's a pinnacle of a song. It's just sort of, the song grows and grows and grows and grows and then that happens and it's like, ah. Um, favorite thing to watch is there's something about that boy, which is the ending of act one. And I know, sometimes sit with Julia um, up on the, on the catwalk I sometimes sit down in the pit and listen to it because that's also fun. But that that moment, there's so many things going on, and it's just organized chaos in a way that is so fun and cinematic, and it's it's really thrilling to watch. So that's one of my favorite things to watch. Also, Roger Bar. <laughs> of course, I do watch you, Roger Bar. I do, I do, I do. Speaking of Roger Bar, in case he likes. Um, one of my favorite things to have watched about the evolution of the show since you all started previews back last June is the relationship and the chemistry that you two have together. I think it is just, it has grown so much and is so exciting to watch for audiences, whether you're watching it for the first time tonight or you've been watching it grow over the past 12 months. And I remember interviewing you both before previews even started and talking about what you two mean to each other and the relationship you're just starting to form. But I'm wondering today, now that you're about a year in or a year in, what do you two mean to each other, and why is it so exciting to just see you two have the most fun up on that stage every single night? You first. Uh, okay, okay, I'll go. Um, no, I love Case. You know, it, 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 it's it's listen. It's really it, 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 it's nothing sort of sadder than. Don't you, get, you guys ever see a movie and you find out like the two leads hated each other? And just, yeah. You know, there's something always a little like. Usually they have the hottest. They have hot, but yeah, they have, yeah. But do they? I don't know. They do. I don't know. It's just film is weird that way. But you know, it's what's fortunate is that you know, you you get to watch. You know, this is like a buddy movie. Much of this show, you know, and buddy movies always have a, a very, you know, when I think of things like you know, Lethal Weapon. Oh, that's my eighties movie. <laughs> I'm glad we did this. Anyway, I'm glad I found it. I, I, I knew I'd stumble on it at some point if I just talked to it. But, you know, it's like, they're, even in the worst and dire situations, they're making jokes and busting each other's chops, you know what I mean? And, and that's, that's really important, I felt, because you get to watch a friendship that's really good, and then you go back in 1955 and you watch a friendship form right in front of you. And with one party already knowing, hey, we're great friends, dude, you know, and the other one going, I don't know who you are. 
So, uh, but so you get to watch them become friends, and 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 so it was really important to me. Casey and I, you know, we we connect with each other uh, uh, before the show. We connect with each other. Some a lot of days off. We'll say, we just reminds me. You know, I have two daughters. He's sort of like I always like my sweet son. We have a you know, we have a good time, and uh, you know, we root for each other on stage, and we're kind of got each other's back. But we also, you know, we mess with each other too. You know, which is. It's just good, healthy fun. I think the audience picks up on that. But it's really organic. It's not, it's, we're not, um, you know, we're not a people who don't like each other. We're, we're, we're having a good time and it's, it's real out there, you know. So that's, I think that's really transmittable and, um, and hopefully, you know, you guys kind of, yeah, or, and people who come see the show can pick up on it, you know. Did I tell you Thank you. Thank you. Um, it was everything you said. Um, you know, there's there's not a lot that I, I want to repeat about that. But other than that, uh, you know, the other thing for me is is that um, it's also really um, it's rare to to make friends with someone who has been in the same position as you in the past. Um, I've gotten to work with uh, a lot of people I've looked up to before, um, but not in quite as intimate of a way. Um, and uh, it's just great. It's great. Um, at least for me, hopefully uh, it is for him too. But it's great to be able to connect with someone who is thinking the same thoughts as you uh, most of the time, because we both, um, you know, we both been leading men on Broadway. We both um, uh, gone through this life, which is a very, very specific niche like path um, uh, that a very few lucky people have gotten to do. And um, so it's just great. I really love connecting with him over that. And also, you know, he's in 44 years of it. So uh, I, I also feel like part of my job at this point is uh, also to, to uh, entertain him and to, to, to keep, uh, we keep each other alive, um, even though this is brand new for me comparatively. But, you know, a year in, we, we keep finding ways to entertain each other. Uh, one day I'll even be able to sort of, uh, um, in, in a way, describe, he'll be able to experience what unemployment feels like. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Oh. I'm looking forward to that call. You know, you're not, I can't get arrested out here. What's <laughs> happening? You know? Is that, a, that I'm an expert in as well. When you're at yeah. home. It sounds like, like yeah, to, yeah. The Raj, only, you're the, the home, if I'm lucky, yeah. And, uh, and hopefully at that point he'll go, oh yeah, no, I, I was out of work there for a few months. <laughs> You know, because he hasn't—he hasn't really felt that that sting. Mm -hmm. That's uh, yeah. intense, man. Wow, you're really yeah. talking it up. I'm wow. wishing it. Yeah. Wishing it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. You see this swagger? Wait, wait, wait. Give him a. <laughs> I can't wait to see you in the home. <laughs> it's so fun. Roger, turn up your hearing aid. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Do you remember? <laughs> First thing that's wrong. Dog, you remember that shit? I already, I'm already fixing up my daughter's garage, and it's gonna be no home. It's no home for me. You're gonna stay in the garage? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in her garage. Oh. It's gonna be a converted garage. It's gonna go really well. It's good. <laughs> put on show albums. Put on Mandy Patinkin's album. <laughs> this is gonna be the headline for Broadway. Can Robbie. I stay with you? <laughs> Roger Bart's plans post doc is to stay in his daughter's garage. <laughs> I live in my daughter's garage and listen to Mandy Patinkin albums. Good times. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Um, uh, you can tell that you all are so bonded together as a cast. And I'm curious, we've had a few new additions to the cast come in over the past few months. What has that been like welcoming them? We don't like to talk about them. Yeah, they're not good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> she's, uh, she's actually understudying that. Um, and and, uh, and, um, and David. A couple David Josephsberg has joined us. Evan Smith. Evan, Evan Alexander Smith from Marilee Zwizzolz. We have with the wonderful Susie Carroll. Susie. Yeah, okay. If you don't know, you will know. And then, of course, we have Katie and Katie Aaron. Luca. Katie the Luca. The Duke. The Duke. Here's the thing. Um, everyone who joins gets to see what's going on inside this wonderful building that Julia talked about and has helped create. You know, it's, it's really led with kindness, openness, and, and fun, but also people are great at what they're doing. So there's, it's really fun to see how fast people absorb and how um, they're just great additions to our beautiful company. 
Yeah, one of the one of the sweet things that, that I think we all take pride in is that whenever people have the first night on Broadway in our show, there's a lot of love and support. I mean, I know this is probably typical of, of every Broadway show, but it feels really, it feels real. That's true. Because I remember one time I joined and it was not that, but <laughs> it's not that. But it, it really is kind of it, it's it, incredibly supportive and sweet, and I think that they feel. It, it, it just makes it just it just makes for a great company, you know. We're we're all about positivity, openness, welcoming, and support. You know, that's this is this is wonderful world of Back to the Future, which is um, it, it, if you really listen to the lyrics, everything is all about optimism. Everything is about hope. Everything is about uh, pushing forward and, and thinking positive. This is very Broadway dot uh, not Broadway dot com Broadway con uh, coded. Um, David Josephsberg has a Broadway connection to my uh, mom, who was on tour with her in Les Miserables, and then uh, they both did Broadway. Yeah. Well, that was cool. Yeah. Both did what? Well, both did what? They both did Les Miserables. Wow. Yeah. That's so this photo. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. They're literally right next to each other. It's insane. So yeah, and then sometimes he plays Doc, um, which is wild, because I'm like, opposite him, and my mom was opposite him, so that was wild. Because he understudied Marius, and my mom understudied Cosette, so they wouldn't go on with each other, and she understudied Evan. My dad drove through Arizona. We <laughs> <laughs> are we're really connected. <laughs> I don't remember. No I still don't remember. <laughs> yeah, it was like the eighties. Yeah, I still don't remember. Roger and I both played animals. <laughs> is that true? Right? That's, that's, that's our thing. Go see the, all these connective things. Yeah. yeah. I just shut up every time. <laughs> I love it. Um, so in the, the last decade or so, we've seen a lot of film adaptations coming to the Broadway stage. So I'm curious, in general, what do you think makes a good adaptation of movie to musical? Let's ask the New York Times, shall we? Please. <laughs> Jesse Green. Um, I, I mean, I mean, do you want to answer this? this I have no idea. I, well, I, here's what I think. I think if it's as true as the movie as possible, people are gonna love it. You can't take out anything that's necessary to the plot, or you can't make us think too far away from what it is. And that's what I love about this show, is that they really paid attention to the, the magic milestones and moments in the show and recreated them with such Broadway flair <clears throat> um, and with love. You know, and this show is literally a love letter to the movie. And, and I think that the fans feel that, it radiates with them, and they understand that. And um, I think that's why our show is doing, you know, it, it's spreading joy and nostalgia. Uh, I'm trying to figure out the answer to this as well. Um, I've done two critical bombs in a row, but they've both gotten crazy audiences. So I am absolutely thrilled to be a part of shows that, at the end of the day, bring people to the show. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, I'm, I think it's a great era to be um, doing shows because nobody knows the answer. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like nobody has an answer of what is good, what is bad. I mean, there were even mixed reviews. There were reviews that didn't like The Outsiders, and it's the best musical of the season. So you sit there and you go, who knows, man? Just make something that you feel like, like, like. People say it's the best. Well, Sephora, right, 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 right. They won, they won the Tony, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's fantastic. But, but, but. Yeah. But, but, but. Um, it's just great. It's fantastic to be able to make something that people resonate with, and that is that is something we cannot take away from the show, which is there are people there every night, and there are people like Megan that come back over and over and over again, and I have never done anything like that, quite like that. That is really special. Yeah. I'm wondering if there are any changes from the original movie for the musical that you think have enhanced the story in any way. Well, I think the Libyans would feel very strong. <laughs> I mean, 
they, they, I know living ah. equity is kind of still real. <laughs> <laughs> but, so many. Uh, for what people who don't know what I'm talking about, there, there, you know, the doc was originally shot down by terrorists. You know, um, but that was a little. It was a little. It, even when I went back to look at the movie, it was a little like really like 18 shots to the chest. It was, a little much, you know? it was like the Falachi Papers, another 80s movie. <laughs> <laughs> 70s. Anyway, but but you know like. But, you know, there, there are certain things that are, it, it's not that it's, um, it's just inappropriate and we didn't want to do it, you know, so that's, that's an improvement. It was, and it was, it came from uh, Robert Zemeckis who, who directed the movie. He did, he was like, no Libyans, you know, none of that. Let's come up with something else. So, you know, there, there are things like that that are, are, are great improvements and, um, but what else, have we improved anything else? Yeah? I, I think we're, I think we're... You want to use your mic? I think <laughs> I, I honestly, I've watched it. The musical has a lot of heart. Yeah. It has, this guy brings a lot of heart. I was just. <laughs> it, Are you a relative? Hello. <laughs> okay. But it is that, that the him kind of telling George, you can do this. I can do it. You can do this. There's a lot of heart in this darn show. You know, also, you know, the, the musicals do something pretty cool, too. It's just like, you know, it, Michael J. Fox probably had a look like he saw his old man and was like, oh, gosh, you know, we're lucky. He's a good dad. He's the best. And what's so great about music is that it gives, it gives a character an opportunity to kind of do really what is the equivalent of a long push-in close-up, which is he gets to sing, I've got no future, you know, and you go, you, you immediately get a melody to, I have sang you just then, didn't yeah, I? Yeah. Oh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, man. Sorry. But, um, but that really does give it, <laughs> it gives an opportunity to, for, for people to sort of really feel. And so the, the, the movie stuff is just sometimes the musical allows you to, to have things run deeper. And music is the great, you know, it's a it's tug at the heartstrings. You know, we have, we have strings in our orchestra. It's, you know, it's pretty sweet. There are times when we do like 11 underscoring, which is also beautiful. And it, Alan Silvestri wrote the best underscoring of editing I've ever heard. And you know, the first times we had him put his his music into some of the transitions, I'd be like, you know, Mari, I'm gonna be sad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just <laughs> you know, it's just so good. The music's like when you listen to it, you just start to break down and you it, it's not it's just beautiful. So I don't know. Also it's real. I mean it's live in front of you, you know, yeah. like there's like stuff happening. Yeah. Sometimes my stomach just hurts and I just want to go home. But <laughs> so what you're, I've moved in other ways. You know what I mean? I just want to go home and move up. Um, that's great. Very so that's what you don't get in a movie. My, uh, yes. my flora. Roger. My, my flora is very moving. Okay, Eduardo, we'll stop. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is Eduardo. Eduardo's our company manager. Give it up for him, y'all. Oh, yeah. Eduardo. Eduardo, can you please stand? Yeah. Yeah. The best on Broadway, right there. Eduardo's checking the uh, ticket refunds as he speaks. <laughs> as, as he talks about his flatulence. No, um, no, no, I didn't say anything about flatulence. Uh, I about something else. No, I said something else. No, 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 that's lowbrow. But, <laughs> Real deep stuff. New York Times, bro. <laughs> I want to touch on the technical elements of the show because the things that are going on on the Winter Garden stage are some of the craziest things that I've ever seen on Broadway, and I think it's just really exciting to watch as audience members. So maybe starting with Julia, can you just walk us through some of the larger act, um, action sequences and everything that goes into making that happen night after night? Uh, the clock tower sequence. Clock Tower sequence, far and away, is the uh, most exciting sequence for us. It's, it's all built on all the elements coming together. The, um, we recently, Eduardo organized a thing for, um, what was that? Uh, Camp Broadway. Yeah, Camp Broadway, where um, the kids came in and we broke down one of the drive sequences. But uh, the, the thing is, is the car is really neat. Um, the clock tower going across is really neat, but it's not really neat without the 
projections on the screen giving you that movement and it's not without the orchestra booming underneath it and without the sound coming in and then you take all of those elements and you put the stakes of the actors there and it gets really exciting and putting that together so that your you know Rando and uh, John Rando and uh, our director and the designers and everyone building that sequence uh, just step by step. It's, it's really like everything has to be right on the money. And Roger and I, when I, I picked up the show in London, but it's different here. We have a wider stage and things like this. And, and Roger would say, I just need more time to finish that beat. He'd need more time to finish that acting beat. And I would go back and I'd figure out what that meant. And I'd get with Ted and I'd say, Ted, we gotta wait for blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's coordinating that. Now, now we do it and we know what works and timing, but that is, for me, the most technically and all the elements coming together, including giving a platform for the actors to really tell the story. Totally, and then for the actors, what is it like getting, being able to do that, be in the car? How exciting is that? Similar to how Roger's chair was earlier. <laughs> <laughs> very tight, very small, um, and uh, uncomfortable. But it is like also like the best thing in the world. Like I literally, and, I, and still, a year later, I think pretty consistently, almost every single show, I literally cannot believe that I'm being paid to sit here right now. Like, that is insane. It is literally like, it's a ride for y'all, like, but it's a, it's a literal ride for me. Like, I'm <laughs> actually in a car, and it's actually moving, and there's actually scenery moving around me. It is really, really bizarre. And just like, I mean, when I just think, I'm like, when we were talking about, like, you know, if we were gonna sign on, sign on for another year or whatever, yeah. and, you know, I just sit there and I go, I don't know when the next time I'm gonna get a job like this. I don't know when the next time there's gonna be a show that comes around that does this and is like this fun. I just don't know. So, yeah. Great. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for any of our panelists? I think there's a microphone. That will come around. Oh, right here. Wonderful. She's ready. Oh, yo, there's a line. Oh, so I guess I line up. Yeah. I'm up and talking to the mic, and we'll chat. Wow. Hi, I know this girl. She's from Arizona. Hi. Um, if you had like something to tell your younger self, what would it be and why? Also. Um, Casey, what do you have any like suggestions for Haunted House next year or this year? <laughs> so funny. Wait, well, remind me what your first question was. Um, if you had to like, oh, um, if you had to tell your like, younger self something, what would it be and why? My younger self something. Oh man, uh, my, I would tell my younger self um, to keep doing what you're doing because clearly it worked. Um, but uh, but. I would say that what you, what you were doing, what I was doing when I was younger, was I constantly was working on my craft and always improving my vocals and always improving my dancing, and, which I know you do because you do the same theaters that I did growing up. So rock on, um, check in on my sister for me. Um, and also, thank you for asking about The Haunted House. I don't have any plans to do it, um, but now that you've reminded me of it, now I feel like I really should. So I'm gonna think about it, and I'm always producing, and I really would like to do something like that. Um, good to see you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Kimberly Horn. I spoke last night here as a psychotherapist. I specialize in working with people in the arts. I have a super quick question, and then one a little longer. So we saw the show last night, and I wanted to ask you, but I couldn't because I was in the audience. You two seemed like you were laughing, and you couldn't control your laughter. Was that part of the show in one scene? Next question. <laughs> You guys were just like laughing. Um, so anyway, my moments. <laughs> my question: You shared a little bit, but can you share with us about like what it is like for an actor when you're just going to callbacks, you're not getting anything, you're like, do I have to get a day job, and like how you deal with that? 
You know, when things aren't happening for you and you're like, I'm talented, why are people not seeing this? Why is my career not, you know, it's stalled? First of all, I love that the whole, everybody here is looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you've had those times of not working, you know? How, uh, you know just you just sat there with no jobs, you know? Uh, I don't know. A time will hit me, I guess. So many, uh, there's, there's, there's so many things to that. It's just about, you know, being a, a grown-up and sort of dealing. Some of it is about, like, if you're in an audition rut, and a lot of times you'll just want to work with somebody else, you want to mix it up a little bit and, and read with a good friend and prepare differently. Other times it's just cyclical. Sometimes those are periods where you just are in a good zone and you just had a great audition streak. And then other times you're just not. And you know what? Part of it is that you, know, you get to look at auditioning and things like that. They're, they're sort of like, they're just job interviews. And, and everyone I know who's not even involved in the arts just going through a series of job interviews if, if one has to find themselves in that situation. Um, you know, sometimes there you, you get on a good roll and then you're feeling very confident, and other times not. It's always good to remind yourself who you are, you know, uh, by being with your family and being with your good friends. Um, they're the ones that hold your history book of your life with you. So there's life outside of show business. And a lot of it, as I say, is just luck and cyclical. You know, there's sometimes I'll just go up for thing after thing after thing, and it's just they're not right for me. And, and you just have to be patient. So, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, resiliency is a really interesting uh, part of being a human. And, um, and, you know, we just, we're just, um, our anecdotes about uh, being out of work are often out there more just because they make for funny stories and stuff. But in reality, resiliency is just a part of, of being alive and, and everybody has their own mechanisms for for surviving through those. As far as like little jobs, you know, I bartended um, until I was about 27 or 28. And there were many times uh, in between that time where I would, that I needed money, I had two kids. You know, I was, I, I did anything I could. I'd go and work with uh, uh, young kids or I would go and clean out a restaurant with its glassware. You know I mean? And you, you get pretty scrappy when it comes right down to it and the responsibilities are great. So it's a, it's a, it's life stuff, you know, but and it's um, it's tricky, but it's it's ultimately it makes you more grateful when the time comes when you you can breathe for a second. A great real answer. Thank you, Bob. Great answer. Yeah. Oh yeah, for you? Are you kidding? She wants us to sign her program. Yeah. You're so adorable. Next, next question. Yeah. Yeah. And those are um, Skyflower shorts. Yeah, they're Patrick shorts. Well done. Well awesome. done. I approve. Yeah. My pockets for you. Oh, awesome. Oh, wow. oh yeah. even better. Oh. A great party. I have Skyflowers. I love that. Oh my gosh. That's like the sky of, yeah, SpongeBob. Um, okay, hi guys. Hi, Casey. Um, hi, Jelani, Roger. And remind me your name again? Julia. Kobe. Kobe. Hello, guys. Um, <laughs> I absolutely love stage door shows. Some shows that I stage door are a disaster, while others are super fun and rewarding, and I'm proud to say that Back to the Future is one of those awesome stage doors. Right. So thank you so much for making the event experience it's wonderful. And my question for you is, what is your favorite and weirdest experience at a stage door? <laughs> it doesn't even have to be Back to the Future. So you guys have other credits. Yeah, sure, let's talk about it. There was a time I was doing A Too Proud for a stage door. That's right, I was, I was Temptation, and um, somebody threw um, lingerie. That's it, July! Like, with Can you sign it? Huh? Did I sign it? Um, I caught it. Nice. <laughs> And then I brought it inside, yeah. Uh, so I don't know if it was used or not. I don't know. I don't know the, the um, back story, the front story. I don't know any story. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not going to go into the stories. Um, but I, I will say that uh, I was just talking to a friend the other day um, that I will say that our Back to the Future fans are so great because you guys are so like the ones who are repeat visitors are so respectful. 
and it really, really shocks me because it's just like there's not a lot of shows that have like super respectful fans. So I really appreciate it, and it's been so great. Um, and in that same breath, I want to remind people to keep staying respectful. If you are <laughs> not in the big there squad is. that comes back often, but uh, I've had very weird, very weird interactions. Uh, just, just put, just to give me the playbill. We can say our highs and hellos, and let's talk a little bit. Um, and let's move. Just keep it that way. Also, have your camera ready. That's it. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys so much, and congrats. I'm so proud of you. I remember meeting you on the first night. Almost of, famous. Yeah, almost famous. And just to see you grow and be on the stage, just it, it means a lot for me to see this. So. Thanks for being here, and thanks for supporting me. Oh, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> Hi there. Hello. I would love if each of you could tell us about what happened when you booked the job, when you found out that you had it. Girl, you were there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know this wonderful human because uh, we went to the same high school. <laughs> and I actually was back at that high school helping them with their production and I uh, got a call. So I was with my teacher that sort of pushed me into musical theater and her students and crop of students. And, and, and you walked right through my video, which you usually don't do. I walk right through your video, which I usually don't do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was a kind of a full circle, wonderful moment. Oh, was you, we know, we know, you, he asked you at the times. Um, I was, uh, I was, I called out uh, sick out of my last week matinee uh, of Almost Famous, um, and it was a Wednesday. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? <laughs> <But, laughs> I'm Um, no, no, no. I've called out. I called out sick out of uh, almost famous Wednesday matinee, and um, uh, I was not well at the time. Uh, I'll write a book about it someday. Um, and, um, and literally, I had a call with the stage manager. Um, uh, I immediately, after I hung up, immediately got a call from Colin Ingram, the producer. He offered me Marty, uh, and I told him I am shaking. Um, I think. He thought that was a good thing. I was terrified, um, and like I was like thrilled. Of course, I mean it was like an honor, but I was so scared because I was literally not well. Like while I was already doing one, and I uh, so anyways, I got better. I've been in the show for a year. I'm fine, um, but uh, it was amazing and incredible. And then um, uh, the next call was another person calling me mad that I was out of a matinee. <laughs> so uh, that was that was it was kind of a bizarre story, and I was very nervous, but I was thrilled to have the job, and I began getting really excited for it um, as I, uh, as my health journey continued. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I, 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 with this job, I've had, there were so many um, calls because it went on for so long. We started developing it in 2018, so my, my calls were usually about it's happening, or we got the theater, or um, we're going to go back in, or we pushed the date, and now we're there, because I, it was the, you know, the unique, I think, of, of everybody. I, I went through the pandemic knowing that this was at the end of that rainbow, at the end of the tunnel for me, that the light at the end of the tunnel. So it was, um, it was hearing that we were going uh, to the Adelphi Theater in London that really was everything through that pandemic. And um, it was, it was it kept me very, um, I, would, I remember putting myself to sleep running the text. I would run my lines um, to try to kind of calm down from, from uh, you know Governor Cuomo's daily talks, <laughs> <laughs> and so that would that would calm me down. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Great question. Hi. Uh, first off, I saw the show last night, and it was a great experience. You guys are absolutely incredible. Keep it up, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Roger, because when I heard you were playing Doc Brown, it reminded me of another famous science you played on stage, which was Frederick Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw that, that too. Uh, they're both such iconic roles, and I was wondering how you strike that balance between paying homage to such an iconic role and making it your own. Because I want to feel an example. You kind of have a knack for this. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 they're, they're two very different actors who, who made those roles famous and you you uh, and, you know because we're starting to run so on time this does a long answer to some of what how to approach that but the quick one is basically 
you put um, one dash Gene Wilder, one dash Roger Bart, and 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 it's it, it's not even conscious. It's just, I'm not an impersonator. I just sort of look at the beautiful things, the, the little boxes that they that they check when, in their performances that I go, oh, they're so funny at this, good at that, good at that, and I try to find a, a answer to those qualities and those um, things in the ways that mostly are that I could do myself. Otherwise, I would spend the entire run thinking, oh shoot, I didn't do it quite right there. And you have to make it your own, otherwise you won't be really happy, in, in my opinion. So it's really about um, a salad, <laughs> making a salad, you know? Really an art art salad. Thank you so that makes sense, yeah. yeah. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Hello, uh, my name is Jillian Bopp. Um, I saw your show about two months ago with my mom. Um, and I'm an art student, I go to AMDA, um, and my friend who's in the Back to the Future shirt over there, uh, she also uh, goes with me. Um, my question uh, is for all of you, uh, the actors especially. Um, being in an art school and being a student, I want to know if there's a certain mentality or a certain switch, um, whether you went to school or didn't, of where it was like, oh, I'm a professional now, and maybe any advice on that transition, um, like Casey said, on it being a job. Um, I'm, I'm always a student, you know, I'm always trying to learn and to figure out, you know, how to be, how to grow. So professional, I'm, I'm lucky to be working, but I'm also continuing to learn. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Perfect sense. Good answer. Yeah, and you know, it's like, and, and, and you know, just literally, it's some of it's about when you start earning money, you're professional. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I was a professional, but I was making $35 a week in Cape May doing The Learned Ladies by Moliere. Wow. But I was a professional that summer. You know what I mean? I always thought that, that was, I was a professional lawnmower when I was a teenager, too. So, <laughs> you know, I made money mowing people's lawns. That's how what we did. Well, thank you so much for doing this. And Roger, I just have to say, my little brother, um, Go the Distance from Hercules is, was his, like his theme song growing up. He still sings it. So. Oh. Have to That's say that, so sweet. So. Yeah, Thank well, so I am a great school, so you guys got set up well. They really work you really hard, and and, and um, it's, it's it's a wonderful experience for you. So congratulations for, for being there and getting through it if you have. It's great to know. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Devin Manning. I'm a, um, I saw your show uh, last year, and <laughs> funny story is that when I saw the show last year, I actually had to when I got back home super late, I had to pack up because I had a wedding to go to in Florida. <laughs> And it was actually worth it, even though I didn't get enough, enough sleep that night. It was all worth it. Um, I'm a huge fan of um, Back to the Future, and you guys did the show just flawlessly, and I was really impressed. Um, and because I love the movies, and I know it through verbatim, um, I just like want to ask for all of you guys because these are such iconic characters, and you know the actors like you know like Martin, um, Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd did so well. Were there any like challenges you had to face like when you guys were playing these, playing these characters or like any exciting moments like you know doing it too? My quickest, I mean, I'll do this really quick, but my biggest challenge was I wanted to sort of speak in a way that was not me but somebody else and somewhere in the land of, of, of Chris Lloyd's in, in my way it vibrated in my head. It was very difficult for me to apply that to the songs that were written for me because they're so high I could never do both. At one point I just had to let go and go okay I just don't necessarily sing exactly like I talk. And that was a hard thing for me to get over and get through. Yeah, I think it's a fun responsibility to bring these iconic characters to life, but then to put your own twist on it. How do you sort of make it authentic to you and fun for you and not sort of carbon cut what you've seen, but then give it this Broadway layer to it. So there's a lot of trial and error and what made John Randall laugh, what didn't, <laughs> um, and just getting to play. And also working with putting it on stage and putting it on its feet and seeing what worked and what didn't. Yeah, and a lot of it is about like also when you do it eight times a week, some of it is just about how can you do it, you can physically do it, especially with the with your voice, you know, it's all about like you gotta do it healthy, you know. What do you got? Uh, I agree with both your answers. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Um, do we have time for one more or are we done? Yeah, I think we can do one more. One more. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to the people in the back. We appreciate y'all though. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so I've seen the show twice. Yes, you have. I saw it once just over a year ago, and then I saw it again a couple months ago. And I want to know from each of you if you could describe your overall experience doing this show and being a part of this community and this, like, this 
beast of a show, it just in one word, how, would, how do you feel about, about oh, it? Oh, what a great final question. It, it saved my ass, I mean, in many ways. I mean, it really did. I had a daughter who went to college, and I really wanted to pay for it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to send them to the world without student loans, and that's an amazing thing. You know, that's, that, it, it, and, and, it, and it's, um, in another way, for me, you know, I, I went through a period where I uh, just lost a, a handful of people in my life who were so, so close to me. And these guys who I worked with, and, and now with the addition of these people here, to have a family that, that we have a job that lasts even a year or two or three years, in my case sometimes four or five years of working with this creative team, fills a lot of void in, in my heart. And, um, and it, so it's, it, the show is deeply meaningful to me because uh, it's, it's my, my um, a new and beautiful family and I was, you know, I was so afraid that of having, when you lose people, it's, you don't know if you're ever gonna be able to bounce back. You know, it's so hard. And uh, so hopefully none of you had to experience too much of that, but it's kind of what it is. So it's been beautiful for that reason. Um, I just joy. That's the word I have. Just been joy, just from the very beginning. Um, and I just love it. I've just had so much fun, and I'm just so thankful to have this. Have kind of been my college experience um, as well, um, and uh, that's why I stick around. So yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> just, that's what it is. Every day. I just laugh. I have a great time. I'm grateful. Grateful to be able to spread my message of positivity. And grateful to be part of a show that promotes joy. There you go. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. 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 Thank you, ever